Carlton Bourne edits the news. Good evening, everybody. The German Reichstag has been summoned to meet Friday noon, Berlin time, to hear an important declaration by Chancellor Hitler. This is to be the climax of the peace offensive that has been underway informally for the past week. It has already excited important repercussions in England and France. Prime Minister Chamberlain told the House of Commons yesterday that England is ready to examine peace proposals. Nobody, he said, desires this war to continue for an unnecessary day. But overwhelming opinion here and in France wants the rule of violence to cease and wants the word of governments once pledged to be kept. Now this raises the question, who can guarantee Hitler's word except Hitler himself? Neither France nor Britain has declared war on Soviet Russia. It is possible that Russia will play a highly important part in the negotiations which lie ahead. She was barred from participation at Munich, although she then stood with Czechoslovakia against Germany. It would be a satiric turn of fate's wheel if this same Soviet Russia should now mediate between Germany and Britain. So far as we know, Italy has so far held aloof. Today's dispatches from Rome indicate no action by Mussolini until after Hitler speaks on Friday. Of course, it is possible that through Count Ciano and the French and British diplomats in Rome, Berlin's terms have already reached both France and Britain. The almost complete lull in military operations does suggest that for the time being, the diplomats have the field to themselves. Meanwhile, Lloyd George and the labor rights in Britain and the communist deputies in France have come out in favor of Hitler's peace plea. That is, they have emphasized the fact that it ought to be given the most careful consideration. And they have done that even before it is made and even before they are aware of its terms. And that naturally suggests a certain division of opinion in both Britain and in France as to the kind of terms that should be expected for peace. Now the question is, can Hitler exploit this division of opinion? Can he accentuate it? Can he, by a very clever and an apparently very generous peace proposal, persuade that slight difference of opinion which has manifested itself in both France and in Britain to become larger and more important. Now, undoubtedly, that would be the clever, the diplomatic thing to do. But the question is whether Adolf Hitler is in a position to make that kind of a conciliatory speech. Now, the French, clever diplomats that they are, anticipate that they may be put in a difficult position. And so today, Prime Minister Daladje confronted the Foreign Affairs Commission of the Chamber of Deputies and made a two-hour statement before that commission reviewing the cause of the war, the events of the war, and French policy. And that was, of course, the answer to Hitler's Reichstag speech by anticipation. Because sometimes when a diplomatic move is made in advance of the normal time for it, it's much more effective than it is made after your opponent has made his move. In other words, sometimes by anticipating him, you can nullify the effect of what he is trying to do. Now, following this two-hour conference, the French government issued an unusually long communique in which it reviewed and summarized the Dalajé speech. And it cites how Dalajé gave the war aims of France, and that he stated that while the immediate cause of the war was the German-Polish conflict, the basic cause was Germany's desire for domination. And I'm quoting now from this communique that the French government has just issued. He recalled the progressive forward steps of Hitler's imperialism since the annexation of Austria and the destruction and enslavement of Czechoslovakia up to the unjustifiable aggression against Poland. He related the efforts by France and England in a spirit of intimate collaboration and notably from August 22nd onward to make possible a pacific settlement of the German-Polish dispute whose origins and various stages he reviewed. He showed how these efforts, seconded by Poland's attitude, clashed for several days with the system of the opposition and at the end with a brutal maneuver by the German government. There, of course, they refer to the entry into Poland. He paid homage, and this is significant, to the efforts made up to the last moment by Premier Mussolini to avoid catastrophe, 
several times. Prime Minister Chamberlain and now Premier Dalaji have gone out of their way to pay a nice little compliment to Benito Mussolini for his efforts on behalf of peace. That is done with a definite purpose. He recalled how the German government had persisted in its desire for aggression and conquest and provoked a conflict whose entire responsibility falls with the German government. And then he came down to the crux of the matter. What kind of terms of peace would France accept? And here is Daladier's statement to the Foreign Affairs Commission of the Chamber of Deputies as summarized in this official French document. France does not wish longer to live in the state of insecurity prevailing during the last few years and refuses now to bow before violence and a fait accompli. In other words, France must have a peace that will eliminate the state of insecurity which has prevailed in Europe during the last few years and France will not accept as an accomplished fact the partition of Poland. That's what that phrase means. And then it goes on to the final one. Far from France is all idea of conquest or domination. What she desires is not a truce between two aggressions, but a durable peace, guaranteeing in an absolute manner national security within the framework of security for all nations. In other words, we get back to the thing that has been said again and again, that was said to me by the foreign ministers in Europe a few weeks ago, that they have reiterated many times since, and that the prime ministers have reiterated, that unless and until they can be assured that this particular peace, which is now to be proposed by Adolf Hitler on Friday, unless that marks something more than a truce between two aggressions, they are not going to respond to it. And of course the question immediately arises, how could Adolf Hitler himself guarantee that he would change from what he has been in the past? And the moment you put that question to yourself, then you realize the tremendous difficulties that are in the way of these peace moves. Now, there's Italy and there's Russia that are in a position perhaps to effect some kind of mediation. But could they and would they give an effective guarantee? Ah, that's another question. And there is the nub of the difficulty. The Turkish government tonight sent new instructions to its foreign minister who has been cooling his heels in Moscow for a week while the Soviet leaders negotiated with Germany, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Turkey has long been Russia's friend, but the Turkish envoy has not been singled out for any honors during his stay in Moscow. He deposited a wreath at Lenin's tomb today. Now that isn't done in Moscow, and the diplomats there are wondering what it means. Don't forget that Turkey is in a strong position. She controls the Dardanelles. That means she can be Jana's faced She can turn towards the Black Sea and say to Russia, your ships don't get out. And she can turn to France and Britain on the Mediterranean side and say, your ships don't get in. And Turkey, in the World War, when she was much weaker than she is today, demonstrated the competence and the character of the military forces that she can develop on the plains of Gallipoli. Ten correspondents have visited the Western Front. I've read the reports of three of them in various Midwestern papers, and they all agree in saying nothing about big operations present or in prospect. Scouting operations, yes, nibbling at enemy lines, total German casualties on the West Front given as 3,000, in one estimate, five or 600 killed. Well, considering the length of the line, the number of men, this is a very small number of casualties for a month of fighting, and it suggests that the French are holding to their policy of conserving manpower, no major offensive for the time being. Finland heard this afternoon that Russia is placing additional pressure on Estonia. It was reported from Tallinn, capital of Estonia, that Moscow had made an unexpected demand for more territory. She has asked for it ostensibly to establish more Russian air bases on Estonian territory. Now this suggests that Russia may be getting ready to exercise complete military control over Estonia. 
Two weeks ago, Russia summoned the Estonian foreign minister to Moscow and demanded military control of Estonian islands in the Gulf of Finland, the right to send Russian soldiers into Estonia, and the right to establish air bases at several strategic points on the Estonian coast. The demands were granted. Since then, Russia has made additional demands on both Latvia and Lithuania. Just what they involved is not known. But this indicates that Russia is pressing for complete control of the northern Baltic. This is an important strategic region. If Russia gets complete control of the Gulf of Finland, she can control Finland's com commerce. Turning a large part of the Baltic over to Soviet Russia cannot be in Germany's interest. It puts the Soviet Union in a strategic position to put pressure on Germany. It makes it all the more important for Germany to ensure Russia's benevolent neutrality. So, when we remember that Russia occupied the Polish frontier contiguous to Romania, contiguous to Hungary, we see that in the Balkans as well as the Baltic, Stalin has seen to it that Russia receives every possible advantage from the collapse of Poland. Thus far, Germany has done the most important fighting, but Russia has done the most important taking. And tonight, even Japan denounces the anti-Comintern pact. Good night.